part of the Geek Show Podcast Network. We are the Geek Show's podcast that covers films starring about or by pop stars. No, the podcast covers such a broad range of musical and cinematic genres from country and western to science fiction from documentary country and western to science fiction two musical genres. How long have I been saying this for? How long, Aidan? How long? Uh, how long? Um... About, let me just calculate the time just here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Six months, Graham, I think. That would be it. Yeah. Excellent work. Um, but yes, I'm Graham Williamson. I'm your host. I am a film critic for The Geek Show and Horrified.com, as well as a filmmaker. And I've been joined this week by. Aidan Faskin. I also contribute to The Geek Show. You find me on Letterboxd under the username Aidan F. And uh, I'm also dabbling in the film industry now, so uh, busy, busy guy. Paula Abdul and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. It's good already, isn't it? Yeah. Probably don't agree on much, but one things they one of the things they do agree on would be today's film, Oliver Stone's The Doors. Abdul, who was originally hired as the film's choreographer, dropped out because she didn't get Jim Morrison's stage persona. Similarly, Iranian state media reacted to Stone's stated desire to make a documentary about Ahmadinejad by accused him of having previously made a film, and I quote, in commemoration of one of America's perverted and half-mad singers, someone who urinated on the heads of his fans during his concerts. That is a slightly inaccurate telling of the Jim Morrison story, but according to the Doors organist Ray Manzarek, so is this film. So let's get into it. Aidan, had you seen Oliver Stone's The Doors before? No, I had not. I had absolutely not. And uh, truth be told, I mean, because I'm, I, I think we'll get onto the subject later on in this mm. uh, episode, but I love The Doors. Right. And, because I'm, I'm a massive, big, big uh, fan of their work. Big fan of Jim Morrison. Love um, much of their records, uh, some of their 60s work. And much of my, I mean, I this was, because this is my first Oliver Stone film as well. I oh, seen okay, yeah. Of, I, yeah, I hadn't seen an Oliver Stone uh, film before. You know, obviously Graham uh, mentioned that he would like to do an episode on this uh, band anyway. And that's largely because I've always felt he was a bit mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, especially when the inaccurate historical inaccuracies are concerned, because it's not just the doors that he's famous for doing this. He also he's done this with JFK, he's done this with numerous other projects that I'm sure we'll get into. There's Alexander, for God's sake. <laughs> Alexander, which, God help me, I remember thinking had some good stuff in, but Colin Favell's BG's wig is not among that list. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, I, I, it's just, he's just not a director who I take seriously at all. <laughs> and I think that's, just not. that's a good start in a lot of ways, because I think when I was a teenager, I... I don't want to say I took Stone that seriously, but I admired him as someone who was taking like big Hollywood budgets. And they were big. I mean, I think mm. when he made this, the biggest budget ever given out to a Hollywood film was something like 60 million for total recall. And yeah, this yeah. cost about 32 million. So yeah. he's in the big leagues here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And he was someone who was taking them and was making films that were critical of power structures and of America's involvement in foreign war at a time when, you know, the, the Hollywood mainstream was just not that interesting. I mean, 
people remember the late 80s and early 90s now for what mm. was bubbling under. It was like, oh, but, you know, you had Steven Soderbergh winning the Palm d'Or, you had Spike Lee and Quentin Tarantino and, you know, the Coen brothers starting to come. But you could be, like, reasonably into films back then and not be aware of this. Mm. Yeah. The yeah. Hollywood yeah, I mean, mainstream the... was just not interesting to me at that point. I know. And for Stone as a director, I mean, he, he was one of these people who, yes, okay, he could be very problematic, but he, he took a lot of risks. Mm. I mean, I did try and watch one of his Vietnam War films, and it's the lesser known one. Is it Heaven and Earth? With, Heaven uh, and Earth, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with Tommy Lee Jones, which is very telling, because obviously the only big name star in it that I can think of is Tommy Lee Jones. Mm. And then the rest, he focuses on Vietnam side of the yeah. And of the Stone was... He was a soldier during Vietnam. I think he was like 21 at the time. Yeah. He got drafted over or something like that. So, and you know, pray tell. I mean, I, I do find that interesting. It's cool to see a director do that. However, the pro-machoism of his films I've always found like deeply problematic from the get-go. And that's one of the reasons why I haven't decided to venture much into his filmography. Yeah, you and I think I mean? that, yeah. that's a huge part of what led him astray in his later career, because I, I was reading like an indie wire post about him recently that said, oh, his, his politics are, are very difficult to pin down, and you can't necessarily say what side he's going to take on an issue. And it's like, I think his politics are difficult to pin down until you realise that he is going to side with the biggest macho dickhead in the room. And it doesn't <laughs> matter whether that's like a leftist macho dickhead like Castro or a right-wing macho dickhead like Putin. He just mm. likes strong men. That's his thing, I think, as he grows yeah. older. And mm. it, it sort of comes through in the doors a lot, doesn't it? Because, I don't know, it's... the this won't be the last episode that you were on when this goes out. Um, mm. But the last episode we recorded was Amy. And it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this, I, I could not stop thinking about how different that film is, obviously, about another you know, famous recording artist, died at 27. Mm. But if Amy was directed by Oliver Stone... But first of all, it would be called Adam because he's never going to make a film about a woman. But secondly, <laughs> secondly, it would have this tone that you get in the doors that actually uh, this singer isn't self-destructing. They're actually on a Dionysian path to wisdom through excess. And it's just I, I can't take it seriously, man. Maybe if I'd watched it when I was a teenager, and as I say, Oliver Stone was one of the few people in mainstream Hollywood who had some ambition, maybe I would have like gone with it for the purpose of the film. But now I just could not take that stuff seriously at all. I know. I mean, because as pray tell, as a fan of The Doors, I mean, I, I'll come out and say this now. I mean, Jim Morrison... The way, and this is what uh, partly one of the reasons why I guess Ray Van Zerich, Robbie Krieger, who was the guitarist for The Doors, and John Densmore took against it because mm -hmm. they often said after they'd seen the finished cut of The Doors, or, the, uh, or like the theatrical cut, I don't know, the, the way Val Kilmer portrays Jim Morrison is half the time like a stark raving lunatic. Yeah. And through multiple friends of who knew Jim Morrison at the time said that was not the Jim that I knew. He was actually a lot more sensitive than that. He was a lot more funnier than that. And I couldn't find an ounce of humour within this film. Oh, God, no. All. No. And no. Uh, that's all no. stolen yeah. because he is not a humorist by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. It's just like, it, it takes itself far too seriously half the time. And I, I just found that deeply worrying from the start. Because obviously mm. it opens up, obviously, with a very major event in Jim Morrison's life where, um, and he, I think he cites this multiple times in, like, like say, his poetry or, like, interviews that um, as a kid he witnessed in the desert, in the American desert, um, a car accident involving Native Americans. Mm. And that was a very significant story beat in his life um, about how... Um, you know, it, it was just deeply affected, but like it was something like the souls of like the Native Americans like transplanted into him or something like that. And for Oliver Stone to go dancing around the desert, going, Oh, Frey <laughs> Tell, how can we make this into like a very uh self serious, self gratifying event? It's by just like 
following him around and then just like ditching that in favor of like going on and on about half whispered you know you know poetry that's taken out of context for Jim Morrison mm. like after time like half his lines is like poetry that you know obviously he wouldn't record it at the time he, it would have been like way too young to have said that line in that particular context so it's just like you know what this is kind of deeply frustrating in a way <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that that was a regular incident because uh, before I saw this film, I, like you, saw this for the first time when we recorded this episode. But before I saw this film, um, I remember there was an interview with Michael Stipe, I think, back in in Uncut magazine once, mm. where someone mentioned that scene and Stipe's immediate response was, oh, so is that true or is it an Oliver Stoneism? <laughs> and it always <laughs> stuck in my head because this is exactly how you should watch Oliver Stone movies. Love them, hate them. You should always be sat there thinking, is this true or is this an Oliver Stoneism? <laughs> and trust me, there's plenty of Oliver Stoneisms that I'll point out. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go on. Because I, I, I mean, I did watch, there's this very good YouTube video that, um, and I, I normally I'm not bothered by historical inaccuracies. I'm just mm. not. If, if it's like, say, like, I mean, we mentioned Amy before, but that's by account like a very accurate telling. And you can tell yeah. that because Asif Kavadi has like cross referenced it with so many different people. Mm. But Oliver Stone, he's a different kind of filmmaker. He always like a lot of it revolves around conspiracy theories, if you want to take it that point. I mean, that he did that film about what was it with Nick Cage and 9 11? That, that wasn't one of his conspiracy ones, which is weird. I think yeah. when Oliver Stone said, I am making a film about the World Trade Center, everyone just groaned deeply and I think it inhibited him because that mm. is not as bananas as something like JFK where it turns out that um, I th who said it who said it I'm having loads of quotes because I'm remembering back to Oliver Stone's heyday which was a very very long time ago but there was a comedian I think it was probably like Sam Kinison or Dennis Levy or someone like that who says, you know, a lot of people have theories about JFK. Some people think the mob killed him. Some people think the Cubans killed him. Some people think the CIA killed him. But only Oliver Stone thinks they all got together like one of those comic books where Brainiac and Lex Luthor and the Joker all get together and decide to kill Batman once and for all. And that's basically JFK. Also, you know, the other group that wasn't mentioned in that routine was the gays who were like the main <laughs> movers and shakers behind the JFK assassination in Stone's version. <laughs> oh, anyway, back onto this. I back mean, onto the doors, yes. Yeah, because um, this came out the same year as JFK, wasn't it? It did, yeah. It's kind of interesting because it's sandwiched in between JFK on one side and Born on the 4th of July, which is the second in his Vietnam trilogy. And it's it, it does kind of tell you a lot about how Oliver Stone sees the Dawes, that he thinks, all right, Vietnam, the Dawes, the Kennedy assassination, all of these things are equally important in his mind. But Prater, I mean... I don't see it as that, because yes, the doors are a significant piece of like American history. Mm. But I wouldn't compare it on the same level as say like the assassinations of Martin Luther King or JFK. No, no. And it, it's one no. of those things where I think I suppose maybe it's linked to him because he first heard the doors when he was a soldier in Vietnam. So for him it's all part of that same covenant. But as a viewer, it, it goes back to that thing that I was saying earlier where in order to get the most out of this film, you have to take the self-mythology that Stone ascribes to Jim Morrison very, very mm. seriously indeed. And you have to really believe that he's not just getting high and getting wasted. He is actually trying to break through to some greater spiritual dimension. Break on through to the other side. Ha, to ha, the ha, other ha, side, ha, yeah. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Literally. I thought, was, I thought it was good of the Doors to cover a song by Krusty the Clown, by the way. I thought that was, uh, that was quite forward thinking of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I watched this thinking 
that I will at least get something from it. Because I, I mean, I was wallowing in Dawes' research just to get into this episode. Mm. Um, you know, I listened to a few of the records that um, I hadn't listened to before, notably. I think two of the lesser known ones, Waited from the Sun and The Soft Parade. Oh, the Soft yeah, Parade yeah. Got often, and The Soft Parade is often considered their weakest record because of the string arrangements and the combination. I think it goes back to the episode where we talk about Zappa and mm. obviously combining the elements of like classical as well as rock, sometimes doesn't gel well. It's like a scissors and glue kind of approach. Yeah. But it's interesting, the, the Soft Parade isn't, I wouldn't say it's the worst example of this. I mean, some tracks do come out like very well, like say, Touch Me. Mm. That's one of the songs that I think works very well. But then over, and I think some of the songs come in there like half-baked, you know, like not particularly well thought through. I think that's part of the issue that a lot of people take about it, but still not bad. Um. But for Stone, I mean, it, it starts off, I think, obviously looking into Jim Morrison's early life. Mm. And then it, it, it's basically like taking these all these significant events and then obviously truncating them down into like, obviously, yes, this is what the Doors were about. Yeah. Essentially. And, and it just goes and it takes that examination approach where I can't really find some of it. I'm finding deeply concerning from the get-go because it, it just feels to me like, is this true? It goes back to what you're saying. Is this truth or is this an Oliver Stoneism? Yeah, yeah. I think that's my problem with it. It's it's just like where I'm just sat there thinking, then it because you know there's certain scenes in there where I just think I'm, I'm really taking this largely with a pinch of salt. I mean, there's the bit where um, Jim Morrison gets involved in what I like to call paganism. Oh so, boy, we're talking about this already. Yeah, it's a breathtaking scene. Yeah, for all the wrong and reasons. Not... <laughs> and I'm just sat there thinking, hang on, I thought I was watching a biopic on the doors, not Midsummer. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and it's like, I understand that Morrison apparently had like a, a Wiccan marriage ceremony with Patricia Kennelly, who's the the second woman in his life who's depicted here. It depicts uh, Pamela Carson, uh, mm. played by Meg Ryan, and then there's uh, Patricia Kennelly later on. And I thought, obviously, it's kind of dicey to show something like this. It could go wrong in a lot of ways, but Stone. Mm actually brings in the operatic aria from the Yeoman soundtrack <laughs> over the, the sex scene. And I just thought, this is breathtaking. Early 90s Hollywood has a lot of competition for the title Worst Sex Scene in a Hollywood Movie. And I admire that this is going for it. The Verhoeven Cup, you could call it. <laughs> oh, it's like not even sold in the slightest, man. I mean, come <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind it's kind of a ridiculous self parody at this point and you get that straight away because uh, after you see that flashback you mentioned with the young jim morrison seeing the car accident the first time we see val kilmer as jim morrison he's in front of a sign saying needles and there's a lizard mm. walking through the desert near his feet and you think okay so he's going to declare himself the Lizard King and become a junkie. Thank you. Thank you for those signposts, Oliver. I'd have never noticed without them. <laughs> oh, there's that one bit where I think just after like the first performance of uh, uh, where the doors get together, I think at the Whiskey Go-Go or something like that. On London, I can't remember. It's one of those. The London um, Fog, LA. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of those uh, venues that I, I don't think is like, described in the film where mm. obviously Jim Morrison's had his uh, back to the audience at all time. And to be fair, I mean, there was truth to that. Jim, apparently, I think, during the very, very early performances of when the Doors got together, did perform with his back to the crowd, not to be a selfish git, just because he was so nervous. That, I was, was going to say, yeah, that, that, uh, I assumed that was stage fright, but I could not imagine the version of Jim Morrison we've been presented with so far, like having mm. stage fright. He, there was nothing mm. in the movie that persuaded me that that would be a thing. Yeah. And then after that scene, he jumps on the car and then immediately shouts, I am the Lizard King. And this goes back <laughs> to like my, my, my poetry, um, obviously the poetry taken out of context, because it just feels yeah. like, like Oliver Stone like cut out various quotes from Jim Morrison's uh, poems, poetry books, put them all in a blender, <laughs> mixed it all up 
<laughs> and then just started putting it randomly in the film. <laughs> Because he wouldn't say he's the Lizard King at this early on in the stage. That didn't come through in, like, I, I would have said, like, the way everything for the Sun era, which is, like, the third album. This is right yeah. at the beginning yeah. of his career. So it's just like, what the... Hey? <laughs> I think Stone sees absolutely no differentiation between Jim Morrison's art and life, which is why, as you say, you have him you know, quoting things that he won't write for another three or four years, just in casual conversation. And it's why, ultimately, Kilmer... I don't think this is a bad performance. I think it's exactly what Stone wanted, but that's kind of the problem. I think Kilmer always acts like he's on stage. Yeah, yeah, because he always, like, wanders onto stage. And it, it, I think part of it was because it's a very character character acting, basically. Because mm. I, I think Kilmer was basically in Jim Morrison's... Now, I mean, I looked at the IMDb trivia. After the shooting had wrapped, he had to uh, get a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist just to get Jim out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just, like, very, very telling, because he, he embodies it. I wouldn't say well, I mean... I mean, he is. I mean, you can tell he's like going for the full throttle, uh, Jim Morrison, where he's like obviously high off LSD, always on the drink, mm. being a total dickhead to the girls around him, yes. and that's it. That, it's it's that mode constantly. And yes, the real Jim Morrison was like that. Some like some other time. Not every. I'm not. I'm not going to describe him as like a saint or anything because sometimes mm. he wasn't. Mm. He was a hellraiser. But the but like I said, the the Jim Morrison that is often described by his friends or through Ray Manzarek or through any of the band members is totally absent. The funny, sensitive side is completely gone. Yeah, let's talk about Manzarek because he was the most vocal um, in Decrying Stone's film. And I remember, Mm. I think I saw him on the Adam and Joe show once when they had that Channel 4 show. Uh, they did, I think they did a vinyl justice segment with Ray Manzarek, and he said something like, um, Oliver Stone took my friend and he made him into Val Kilmer with like, mm. such venom in his voice. And I thought, uh, fair play, but they made you into Kyle McLaughlin. So, you know, they're <laughs> offering an olive branch here. I know. Um, it's strange because obviously Jim Morrison gets. Basically, the whole attention in this film. Yeah. I mean, the other band members, Kyle McLaughlin kind of does, but he's more like second fiddle in a yeah. way. He sticks out a bit and because that... he's Kyle McLaughlin, but I'm not sure he's given much to do. Yeah, but every time I saw Kyle McLaughlin on stage, I mean, firstly, I mean, I don't know whether I got the sense he was a bit miscast, but all I could think was that just like stuck Agent Dale Cooper with glasses <laughs> and very long hair and sideburns. And that's it. You could totally see him in like Twin Peaks mode. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? He's introduced and Morrison at this stage is already going on and on about reaching higher stages of consciousness through drugs. And Manzarek g- goes, no, I prefer to get the natural way through meditating. And you think, of course you do. You're Agent Cooper. Pub. I genuinely <laughs> wonder if Oliver Stone had just seen that episode of Twin Peaks where he works out what suspect to interview by throwing rocks at bottles and just thought, yeah, yes! that's it. That's Ray Manzarek. That's our guy. Oh, I need to start watching more Twin Peaks. I've only seen like the first couple of episodes. Yeah. Definitely it's, press it's on hard. with it. It's true why everyone yeah. says that season two is rough, but season three is a miracle. Hmm. Yeah, but back on to this. I mean, obviously you have Kyle McLaughlin. You had, um, I think, is it Kevin Dillon as John Densmuir? Yeah, yeah. And I've forgotten who played Robbie Krieger. I think it's Francis Whaley, Whaley? Uh, Frank Whaley, yeah, yeah. Frank Whaley, yeah. And they barely get a lot of time on this. Like, hardly. Yeah, it's interesting, that, isn't it? Because it's not a music biopic in the sense that I was expecting. There's like one scene early on where you have the classic, you know, they're in a studio all playing their instruments and someone says, oh, I I, I could bring a riff in here and before you know it, they've written Light My Fire and Mm. that's it. You know, that's the classic rock biopic scene. But that happens very early and it never happens again. And despite the fact that the film is called The Doors, it then becomes 
absolutely a biopic of Jim Morrison, just Jim Morrison. It's like, I, I'm not a fan of The Doors, so I was not sure about the chronology. And there were scenes later on where I assumed he must have just like sacked the band or gone solo or something or, you know, mm, got a new yeah. band. But I looked it up and no, no, it was the same backing band. It's just that Stone can't be bothered to focus on any of them. Yeah, it feels like Jim Morrison and The Doors, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Not, yeah. It's like that scene in Bohemian Rhapsody where you just assume Freddie Mercury ditches um, the Bat Queen at that time to go solo. Well, he, time, actually, he actually does for a bit like in that. Bohemian Rhapsody, if we're thinking of the same scene. There definitely is a bit where he goes solo. Um, yeah, but... But the time, I think the timeline was out of sync or something like it that. It almost or... certainly is. The timeline in Bohemian Rhapsody is yeah. completely insane. Just, just completely jumbled. This is yeah. just, I mean, it's jumbled, but on a very much different level. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about some of the supporting roles in this, because aside from Kilmer and, as we say, the other actors playing the doors, it is really strange to me that Meg Ryan did this at this time, because this is in the mm. middle of her America's Sweetheart, When Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle yeah. kind of rom-com purple patch. Yeah. And I can understand wanting to branch out. I can understand wanting to do something a bit darker and a bit more dramatic, but I can't understand doing it in a film which just doesn't give you anything to do. Mm. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, to be honest, it took me a while to realise it was Meg Ryan there. Yeah, yeah. And to be fair, and to be fair on her, I think she does try her best. Because you can really tell she she's acting her heart out. Mm. But then you've, when you've got scenes where, um, like the dinner sequence, that I think it's the Thanksgiving sequence. Thanksgiving where Jim Morrison, sequence, oh man, yeah. Yeah, where, it destroy, where Jim Morrison destroys her duck. <laughs> duck or something like that. No, I'm not joking. This was in the film, and no, that isn't accurate in the slightest. That never happened. Never happened. That's an, no. That's another tally mark, Oliver Stoneism. <laughs> um, um, that sequence where he's just like, "You'd cooked my duck. You destroyed my duck, Jim." And then obviously where she threatens to kill him. Yeah. At the end with a knife to a knife to his throat, and it's just like, what? <laughs> I'm just complex that you fit that in, really. Why did you... Okay, we're just going to move on now. Whatever, okay. Yeah, that, that is a really weird scene, and I was trying to work out why it happened, because as you said, absolutely everyone is adamant that nothing like that ever happened. And I wonder if it's because Pamela Carson's family... Um, Carson herself died shortly after Morrison did, but Pamela Carson's family yeah. held the rights to Morrison's poetry at that time. Mm. So if you wanted to quote the poetry, if you wanted to quote it every other fucking line, like Oliver Stone apparently does here, uh, you had to make very nice to Pamela Carson's family. And one of the, the uh, things that is often brought up against Carson is that some people who were close to Morrison believe, however credibly, I have no idea, but they mm. believe she bought the drugs that killed him. And I wondered yeah. whether, like, having Morrison put the knife into her hand and say, go on, kill me, kill me now, is like Stone's way of trying to get that in the film without putting it in the film. Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't make a lick of sense to me at all. Because why would you have it that early on in a scene that never happened? Yeah, and the why? the other thing is, if you're doing it to accuse Carson, you've got the problem that Morrison looks like a prick all the way throughout it. It's like it gets to the point where she's standing over him with the knife and thinking, "Go on, just a just a little slip, that'll do it." <laughs> It's a bad thing. Oh. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's like that. There's a few cameos around the edges that were really fascinating to me. Uh, mostly in a negative way, I would like to, to say. But 
the bit with because like I say not a Dawes fan cannot critique a lot of this on accuracy because I just don't know but by the time he gets to Andy Warhol's factory I'm just cracking oh. my knuckles I think oh, fucking hell yes here we go here we go <laughs> and it is that 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 is another like segment where it's just like why are you giving this so much focus because yeah. it takes up like eight minutes of the runtime. It's just like <laughs> you met Andy Warhol. Wait, wh why are we going into this? What? Why is the Velvet Underground playing? Why is he meeting N Nico? Yes. Look, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I love the Velvet Underground. Mm. You know, but the, the thing is, is like, why is this shoehorned in for the sake of it? If you wanted to like explore Jim Morrison, the myth. You wouldn't do this in this arbitrary way. I think the just, only yeah. like motivation I can ascribe to it is to go back to Stone's kind of choked back, but still definitely there homophobia in that he wants to depict Morrison as the sort of natural, powerful man who is like transgressing everything. Mm. And he needs him to therefore transgress the other major transgressors in LA at that mm. time who were the factory scene and the Velvet Underground because they represent a very queer kind of transgression to Morrison's very heterosexual kind of transgression. But it is absolutely true that Crispin Glover, who I just think is a darling, I mean, he's, a, mm. he's, he's one of America's great naturally occurring phenomena to me, but he is, he is playing Andy Warhol as this sort of besotted schoolgirl who's like all but kneeling down and unzipping Jim Morrison's pants to give him a blowjob. And it keeps cutting back during this scene to Val Kilmer just looking at him with this sort of look on his face that says, yeah, I see through you. And I don't think he did. I mean, I don't... My attitude towards Andy Wall is that he was a kind of charlatan, but he was a fascinating and an original charlatan. And I mm. just, I do not approve of throwing him in there and just saying, can you believe this shyst of, you know, co comparing that to Jim Morrison? I mean, I imagine if Morrison was anything like Stone depicts him here when he went to the factory, his thoughts would have been less... I see through you, you art world phony and more. You're my best mate. It, it doesn't help that in the sequence, the ca I, I like to think the cameraman was also on LSD. Because <laughs> constantly the camera just swirls around the room like this. It's just like. <laughs> I will Come say. On. I will say something in its favour here, which is that The Doors is less of a stylistic mess than a lot of early 90s Oliver Stone was. Like When I got into this, I had a figure that it was going to be something like Natural Born Killers or U-Turn. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. And like I said, this is my first Oliver Stone movie, but I, I remember how... I want to say stylish Natural Born Killers was because because that was a film that also got a lot of controversy when it came out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't available so, on VHS in this country for a very long time. Hmm. But it's it's sort of you you've seen clips of it, right? You know what it's like. It's this sort of frenetically edited seven different film stocks in every scene. You know, there's something like about a hundred needle drops in it, and most of them are just seconds long. And I think Stone defended it at the time by saying, ah, well, you see, I'm, I'm talking about the mass media, and the mass media now is about sensory overload. And it's like, well, okay, fine. But then he turns around and does U-turn. And you turns just like a simple thriller. It's just like the sort mm. of thing that would be made for a couple of grand with some jobbing stars back in the film noir days. And it looks exactly the same. You know, it it, it feels like something that you could make on the same basis as something like Detour, where it would just be a good 70-minute yeah. cheap film noir and in the first scene, it like switches back and forth from black and white to super saturated color to like standard film images. And you just think, oh, fuck, he's doing it again. Yeah, yeah. It's, just like... it's baffling. Yeah, it is incredibly baffling. Yeah. 
But it, it's it's a bit better than that in this, I think, even though, as you say, the camera work is like the cameraman is apparently mounted on the deck of a galleon in choppy waters for much of it. But it doesn't mm. have that quick cut style that I think has aged like milk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because at least with some of this, you can still see that it's well made and well accomplished. Yeah, yeah. And like I say, yeah. it, was a, it was a big budget film and the concert scenes are pretty spectacular. There are huge, huge, huge crowds of extras. Mm. You know, it's staged exactly like a big stadium concert would be. Yeah. It, it absolutely has that going for it. And the ac- inaccuracies in those sequences bothered me less because obviously you just like change minor details where, um, like say, for example, there's like a bonfire in the mm. middle of like, like I think one of the outdoor co- concerts later on the scene with all the crowd around it, and you know that, that bothers me less because at least it's given it spectacle. Yeah, at least it's given the film, you know, something, some images to obviously remember it by. It's just the matter of the fact of indoors, where we see like Jim Morrison unvarnished. Yeah, that's really problematic, and the liberties with that, and the liberties with the material. That's that's the problem. I think. Yeah, completely. And it's 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 like you you said earlier, you know, I too am not normally uh, someone who nitpicks inaccuracies in film. And I think there is something absolutely valid about looking at a life like Jim Morrison's and saying, all right, we'll do the let's print the legend version. I think as a motivation, I'm happy with it. It's fine. My problem is, is that even I am sat there thinking, I don't know much about the real Jim Morrison, but he can't have been this dull. He can't have been this one note. He can't have been like this all of the frigging time, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's. I think it's not true at all. It, it, it's complete bullshit, basically. And in Stone's movie, basically the lead character, rather than being Morrison, is the image of Jim Morrison. It's why when it gets into the last act of the film and he's on the downward spiral, you know, you you get a few scenes where everyone is saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't be into heroin, heroin's bad news. But the thing that gets brought up most often is that he's got fat. It's like that is Jim Morrison's unforgivable sin in the view of this movie. It's not that, you know, he, he drank too much or he took too many drugs. It's that he did it and parked out a bit. And then at the end, I mean, spoiler warning for a story which everyone knows the end of, but there is that ridiculous, like, beatific shot of the camera drifting into his bathroom and he's just lying there calmly dead in the bath. And it's like Mm. the the lighting is, I think it's meant to be a sunset, but I did briefly worry that a nuclear war had broken out outside the window (laughs) and everything was on fire. And it is like (laughs) the film is saying... Ah, uh, but don't worry. When he died, he was hot again. <laughs> God, I would hate to imagine. Judging from obviously Jim Morrison got getting fat, I would hate to see Oliver Stone's biopic on Elvis. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny, that, isn't it? Uh, I I kept thinking of Elvis throughout the film and I definitely thought that the later stuff is very much the fat Elvis years but you forget that Elvis died after Jim Morrison Morrison was part of the first wave of drug related deaths in rock and roll you know it was him Mm. Janis Joplin Jimi Hendrix all died within a year or so of each other and I suppose Mm. part of the reason why this film is like it is is because there must have been a lot of people around who wanted those deaths to have more significance, who couldn't handle the idea that someone mm. so beloved would just just die in the bath, you know, like like yeah. people with drug problems often do. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, and, and we do discuss this in the Amy Winehouse episode as well, mm, mm. about the idea of... Um, the 27 club and everything well, well, yeah yeah well not just 27 club i mean rock star deaths in general because obviously they hammer this some of them not all of them i mean obviously someone like a big hero of mine joe strummer he hated mm. drugs frank yeah. zappa look at frank zappa he would advocate against it 
yeah not advocate against it like go against it all the time and refuse to have drugs as part of the um his band mm. you know but obviously the, the people who fall prey to drugs or alcohol or anything like that it's like taking a massive toll on their body as yeah. well so you wonder why they end up dying so young it's funny isn't it when you look at the rock star deaths that spark conspiracies and there is often an element of mm, sort, sort, sort of wanting there to be a different ending obviously everyone always wants there to be a different ending when someone dies young but mm. i think when amy winehouse died there is a sense of oh my god that's terrible but you know we really did see it coming whereas when it's someone like Tupac Shakur, I think Tupac Shakur was probably the last major musician death to have these conspiracy theories about it. And there mm. are like all sorts yeah. of ideas that he faked it and he ran away to Cuba and all this stuff. And it, I can sort of understand those because there's something kind of horrible about looking at someone like Tupac and thinking, you know, even when you get to that level, if, if you come from a deprived area, you can still be a victim of gang violence. So I understand why people need to believe that. But mm. with Morrison, I don't know, it's just, it does seem to come from this element where, oh shit, we haven't had anything like this happen before. You know, can rock stars die young? Is that a thing that happens? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, with Morrison's death, I didn't get an overwhelming sense of sadness. Mm. Uh, not like Amy not in the no. same way as Amy Winehouse this one it just feels oh crap, you know, rock stars died it's yeah, it's the it's same way of... how I feel yeah Oh, well, but let's face it, we saw it coming. Yeah, and I think that's because Stone never decides how he wants you to feel about the drugs and the drink it's like he recognises towards the end that there is obviously an element of tragedy to this because, duh, he dies. But he spent the whole rest of the film saying that, you know, drinking and taking drugs is part of Jim Morrison's mystic journey. And you think, OK, why should, why, why should I be sad when this happens then? He did exactly what he wanted. I don't... And I think it bothers me more that he portrays jim the way he does as well and it goes back to you know because that like i said that's that duh, that that's not jim morrison that's a caricature yeah. yeah a really a really banal stereotype that i wish would just die with a vengeance on yeah. <laughs> I, I think rayman zerick said that's not jim morrison that's jimbo morrison <laughs> Jeez. it was actually quite an insult and but going back onto this shall we talk a little bit about the doors uh, and the idea of music history. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Because, yeah. like, like I say, I could, I could never get into the Doors, and I think part of it is I, I don't like Morrison's voice and I don't like Morrison's lyrics. And there was a part of it where mm. I went into this and I thought, is this going to be one of those things that sways me? A lot of films we've done on pop screen have swayed me to start mm. enjoying the music of people I was not previously into and then Riders on the Storm starts playing I thought no no it isn't um so that was my journey this week <laughs> but fair enough <laughs> but I like um... I like Ray Manzarek and I think there is there is something interesting about what he brought to their sound and a lot of bands like Echo and the Bunny Men, who I was just listening to this morning who were hugely influenced by the Doors wouldn't exist without them I like them very much but the doors themselves, I cannot get into. Which is fair enough. I mean, as for me, I've mentioned that I was a big doors fan. I mean, they were probably, I mean, at the time I was like in my teenage years. So, I mean, I was, it was getting into a lot of rock and metal music. So, say mm. like ACDC, the classic examples ACDC, Moorhead, Black Sabbath. Some yeah. I'm still fans of today, like Black Sabbath, I still really enjoy. Mm. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not too swayed on ACDC because they seem to be releasing the same album over and over and over. Yeah, and over like, again. It's Ramon syndrome, isn't it? If part of your appeal is we do back to basics on pretentious rock, like that's got. There's a limited amount of time that you can do that and have it stay fresh. It's a great thing while it's you know still vital, but 
you're not going to have like a massive shelf life in artistic terms, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think part of the reason, I mean, it was my dad who got me into the Doors. He's a big, big Doors fan as well. Mm. And I think he put on LA Woman, which was the last record. And it's my favourite of the Doors records as well. Yeah. Because it's the Doors at the most raw, I think. And Jim Morrison, when you listen to that, obviously, when you listen to like, compare it to like the debut record, which is like obviously much different in terms of like style, where it just feels like, um, like a lot more mystifying. It's like the, the guru sign of Jim Morrison, whereas this, it's like the insane Jim Morrison. Yeah, <laughs> Like yeah. scream, it, wellowing at the top of his lungs and like spurting out. But it's just a lot more raw. And I, I, I actually really like that bluesier, earthy sound as well. Mm. So, yeah. It's straight out. My memory of the Doors, and I do have childhood memories of the Doors, um, because... I think the first time I ever noticed that there was a trend in the air, the first, like, I, I couldn't really put my finger on it because I was too young, but the first time I ever thought, huh, this seems to be happening a lot, was in that spell in the late 80s, early 90s, where there seemed to be a lot of reissues of um, 1960s hits. And ironically, considering that there is a bit in this film where Jim Morrison is furious that Light My Fire gets licensed for a TV advert, a lot of them were being re-released because there was a TV advert featuring them. There was the famous Levi's commercial with Heard It Through the Grapevine by Marvin Gaye yeah. on the soundtrack. And yeah, of yeah. course, before Spotify, before you could just sort of look something up and play it however many times you wanted, that involved a record company deciding to actively press up new copies of a single mm. and put it out as though it was a new record. And once that happened, it was, you know, it was it was a gold rush. Every record yeah. that had the rights to some 60s band's back catalogue put it out. And it's it's interesting that that happened now because I now realise that what was happening was the first time I noticed a nostalgia cycle, which is one of the things I'm eternally fascinated by. Mm. You look back to the very early 80s and Ronald Reagan's government were saying that they were going to ban a particular uh, 60s band from playing at the 4th of July celebration somewhere because they had, you know, a, a negative character and you know I, I wouldn't mind if it was like the stooges or someone but it was the fucking beach boys so <laughs> you've still like had that that kind of culture line divide in the early 80s where the conservative politician was anti-hippie that was what they were against you know the mm. left wing still had to kind of shed the burden of being associated with hippies but that still you know 15 years on was how the battle lines were drawn and then by the late 80s you've got the situation where all those sort of older hippies are selling out and buying property and buying cars and suddenly they're the consumers being marketed towards so when I think back to my childhood in the very early 90s, yeah, part of what I remember is like Acid House and New Jack Swing and all these fantastic, progressive, mm. forward-thinking musical subcultures that were around that time. <laughs> part of it was also looking at the charts, thinking, why is like half of the top 20 dead people now <laughs> in The Doors? <laughs> Largely because of this movie, The Doors were absolutely a huge part of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I mean, for me, because obviously the 60s sounds are, because obviously on this side of the, of the ocean or the Atlantic, I think it's the Atlantic, I don't mind, know my geography very well. Uh, <laughs> it is the um, Atlantic, you're fine. Yeah, okay, fine. Correct um, ocean, well done. So obviously you have the Beatles, which obviously I don't need to tell you, a pretty big deal. You mm. have the Rolling Stones, you have the Who, and I really like the Who, to be fair. Yeah, um, me too, the other, yeah. Yeah. And on the other side, obviously, you have the Doors, you have Creedence Clearwater Revival, the Stooges, which a lot of people forget Iggy Pop was part of that initial wave, wasn't he? Yeah, the started out in the 60s, even though they feel absolutely like a punk band. They were around easily a decade before that. Yeah, the Beach Boys as well. And I always kind of preferred that sound across the Atlantic because it, it yeah. just to me felt 
even though, yes, the Beatles would get a lot more dynamic at this uh, later on in their career with albums like obviously the White Album and Sgt. Pepper. Mm. Um, the Doors were like obviously doing that like a bit differently as well, obviously, because largely because of like, I, I guess, instead of like um, having like the four piece rock band involving a bass player, that switched mm. out for Ray Manzarek, who's on keyboard. And he is your bass player because who needs a bass player when you've got like a bass keyboard and Ray yeah. Manzarek's left hand? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very true. I think and it's. I prefer I've, that. Yeah. I'd never thought about it before, but I think you're right that the uh, American bands have a more sort of diverse '60s in a lot of ways. Because I mean, we haven't even mentioned Motown, which is a scene that has absolutely mm. no British analog whatsoever. There were a few British soul singers, some of them I love, but um, you couldn't really call it a scene. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, love Motown, mm. love Motown. Yeah. But you also have bands like The Birds, who have more of a folk influence. You have bands like, as you say, Creedence Clearwater Revival, who were drawing from like country and southern rock. Bayou, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And The Beach Boys, who t- to me are the ones who tower above the most of the rest of that generation, who often manage to switch genre within a single song. So mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the Beach Boys. I mean, they've never been a band that I fully explored, but it would be interesting to. But it's one of one of those classic artists that I don't have anything against them. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, but no, it's. I, I think this was because. Could you imagine like Oliver Stone doing any of a sixties band other than the Doors? That's a, a good hit? point. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. No, no, I can't, because you're looking, for, to, to be a proper Oliver Stone subject, you are looking at a band who have some sort of cultural and social significance, who have some sort of link with that Vietnam generation, and are also straight white men, so that's really chopped it down, <laughs> hasn't it, you know? Uh, I can't imagine Oliver Stone thinking the Beach Boys were sort of macho enough a subject matter to really uh, fill out. All, all it, yeah, yeah. All it takes is like one listen to was it? Uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the song. Or like, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah, uh, it's just yeah. Like the like the surfing influence and just like, oh my god, they're like the next you know person to delve into. I wonder what conspiracy theories. I can find with them, and then you just think, well, Oliver, not much. Um, the answer, so... the, the irony is the Beach Boys have a darker story behind them than any other 60s band, but I just mm. don't, I, I can't see Oliver Stone getting past that sort of stripy shirts and surfboards stuff that you have to go no. through to get to it. Yeah, so, so like we said, th- this film is like I said, completely baffling. Very strange. Very, very strange film indeed. What the the time. Yeah. What are the puzzlers about it to me is, like I say, it comes as part of that first wave of 60s nostalgia. And part of that involved a lot of biopics of bands who were around then. And Hmm. Of course, you have the Beatles, you have Backbeat a couple of years later about their pre-fame years um, mm. in the 80s when it's uh, you have slightly older artists. You have a biopic of Jerry Lee Lewis, Great Balls of Fire. But mm. You had slightly before Ray with uh, Jamie Foxx as well. Yeah, slightly, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. On Ray yeah. Charles, obviously. And it's it seems strange that a lot of the bands from that era that I genuinely love do not seem to get that treatment. I'm wondering if they just have rights holders that hang on. But, you know, the Beach Boys didn't get a proper movie biopic until a few years back with Love and Mercy. Um hmm. There still isn't, despite uh, Phyllis Nagy Cavill's screenwriter trying her best with this, there still is not a Dusty Springfield biopic, which is insane Mm. to me because that's a great story and it's a great body of music. And so I'm sort of looking back at it and I'm thinking, why the Doors? You know, why not? Why was it them and not 
as you say, credence or the Rolling Stones or the Temptations or someone, you know, anyone mm. like that. Why the Doors? And I do not think this film has really got me much closer to figuring it out. No, no, it's it's one of those films that honestly just I didn't felt didn't think was necessary. I mean, it was especially when all the I'm just going to say this right now, all the mumbo jumbo that surrounds it, <laughs> yeah. like all the poetry lyrics just shoehorned in Kilmer's performance, which, again, I don't think it's terrible, but still it's very dubious throughout. Yeah. Um, and just half the stuff that we, we haven't even mentioned, I think, like um, death like following around because we always see this Native American throughout. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Following around on the and place. And it's like, which... it's Floyd Red Crow Westerman who a few years after this would play Agent Mulder's spirit guide on the X-Files, which just feels hilariously apt. And there is mm. that scene where Morrison's like drunk out of his head and abusing the audience, which I think the real life Jim Morrison said was like influenced by a radical theatre troupe he'd seen, which might be, you know, might be self-justifying bullshit on his part, but it's more interesting than the mm. idea that he just got drunk and ranted at the audience. But there's that like hold on him leaning back, like uh, half like like slumped over backwards in this yeah, I think, of... I think, yeah yeah it's just after the perform five to one isn't it yeah something like that yeah yeah and this apparition of his spirit guide just hovers over him and i think i just thought fucking hell it's the keep america tidy commercial i just want like one tear to roll down his cheek as he watches this <laughs> and then it just says vimto Sponsored by someone like that in like big ball. Like. I mean, those were mocked at the time because there is a whole strand of Wayne's World 2 that is all about making fun of the spiritual Native American visions in the doors. So, I mean, we talk about a lot of Stone's work as having dated badly, but this this was born bad. I know. It, it's... it's... <laughs> Even as a fan of the doors, I, I, I'm just I hit my laptop in like frustration there. That that's how I express that I wasn't a fa- wasn't impressed. You see what um, you're doing here, you're Oliver. You're you're victimising Aiden's laptop with your cinema. <laughs> um, but I, it's strange because I still want to see. I find him fascinating as a director. Because at the same time, it's just like you come out of an Oliver Stone film, like thinking. Oh, only Oliver could do that. Completely. Only he, only he could get away with this. No one else. I mean, not even even Martin Scorsese. You know, you know, auto is yeah. not always a positive description, is it? And I think Oliver Stone is someone who is an auto in good and bad ways. When it works, as you say, you come out of this film, think, God, no one else could do that. And when it doesn't work, you think. God, no one else could do that. I know, yeah. And on that bombshell. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, that I think that's about covered us for the doors. Um, oh, God, we haven't even talked about the Ed Sullivan performance. Which is complete oh. horseshit, right? Apparently, Morrison only sang the uncensored lyrics to light my fire because he forgot. It wasn't like a yeah. purposeful show of defiance or anything. Yeah, and it, it, it so, and the, the bizarre thing is, is like, um, obviously they wanted the, because obviously the word high was associated with cannabis. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's the reason why, because it was it was the equivalent of saying fuck or something like that. Yeah, at the time. yeah. When you look back at it now, it's hilariously dated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, now it's just, it's just like because they wanted to change the lyrics to girl. Was it, it was like girl, he couldn't get much get higher. Much higher. Was the original, yeah. get the original lyric, and then they want to change to like girl, he couldn't get much better. And then I just sat there thinking, right? Do you know how easy it is to rhyme? The yeah. Simple <laughs> grammar is rhyming. Better does not rhyme with fire or higher. <laughs> But, you know, another uh, aspect where the Doors were influenced by the groundbreaking work of Krusty the Clown telling the Red Hot Chili Peppers to change the lyrics to give it away. Oh, God, yeah, I forgot that episode <laughs> The Simpsons exists. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's yes. when the cameo, yeah, that's when the cameo appearance is meant to damn. Oh, absolutely, yeah. 
the happy days when everyone would just queue up to be insulted on The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. But yes, uh, that's about your lot for this week. If you enjoyed this podcast, remember we have Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show, where among many other exclusive podcasts and articles, you can also get a monthly bonus episode of this very show. But until next time, uh, that's been your lot from Pop Screen. I've been Graham. I've been Aiden. And we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.